The Mortal Kombat series has long been a staple of the video game community. Get over here! A household name synonymous with bloody, violent fun. Ow! However, behind the silly costumes and over-the-top one-liners lies a surprising underdog story. But what moves did it make to stand out from the other fighters? I'm Dave Klein, and this is the history of Mortal Kombat. The Mortal Kombat is a titan of the fighting game genre nowadays, its beginnings were significantly more humble and more ninja-y. And remember, Mortal Kombat is totally true to life. According to Daniel Piscina, the actor who originally portrayed Johnny Cage, the game was initially meant to focus on a group of historical Chinese ninjas, the Lin Kuei. This is sort of the very first concept of the story. This this guy here eventually became Shang Tsung. John Tobias, then a new employee at Midway Games, took the idea to his boss, Ed Boon. However, the initial pitch wasn't exactly a success. Boon liked the idea of a fighting game, but didn't think the specific concept would work. They wound up canceling the original idea, instead choosing to pursue a mainstream game with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Piscina was reportedly furious, saying, I gave a bunch of great kung fu ideas, and they were now going to give them all to Jean-Claude Van Damme. Van Damme, of course, declined to do the game, but his influence lived on in Johnny Cage, whose general style bore a strong resemblance to the action star. <laughs> Though the Van Damme plan fell through, the game was far from KO'd. Tobias repitched the original idea, and Midway, seeing the success Capcom had found with Street Fighter II The World Warrior, decided it might be worth a shot. In 1991, the project's development team included just four people. Boone, the sole programmer, Tobias, one of the artists, John Vogel, the other artist, and Dan Forden, the sound designer. The group opted to use real actors to portray the fighters, an unusual choice for the time, and certainly not one without its challenges. According to Piscina, the team experimented with every martial art move for about three days, eight hours a day, filming everything to be later used in the actual game. The production was bare bones. The team was sure this would be a small game and cut corners where they could to stay within budget. They filmed everything over the course of five days in a space that was Essentially, a hallway and, during that time, finalized thousands of details, including finishing moves, catchphrases, and even weapons. Many iconic choices came down to decisions made by the individual actors. Liz Malecki, a fitness instructor who had been tapped to portray Sonya Blade, opted for Army Green tights to line with Sonya's Special Forces background. When all was said and done, Mortal Kombat stood out from its contemporaries, and not just because of its costuming choices. Unlike many other fighting games at the time, which ended every match with a knocked out competitor, Mortal Kombat gave players the opportunity to, well, finish it. Mortal Kombat's signature finishing moves were complex, violent, and gleefully gory, a spectacle for arcade goers everywhere to laugh and wince over. This was thanks to Boone, who was tired of the cleanliness of other fighting games and, in a burst of bloody brilliance, insisted that players should have a way to finish their opponent off. I remember John saying, let's have Sub-Zero grab the guy's head and pull out and show the spine going, you know, just like in Predator. From there, the team was a whirlwind of gory ingenuity, pitching increasingly over-the-top moves for every character. With everything finalized, it was time for Mortal Kombat to face its toughest opponent yet, the Arcade. In 1992, the team planted their prototype machine in a Chicago arcade. Tobias hung around to keep an eye on things. In a blog post, he said, Our prototype machine collected game data that we could access through its diagnostics, but nothing could recreate the player's reactions to the game like being there to watch it firsthand. We take notes on things that we thought needed fixing based on how the players reacted to certain events. We tested the game for countless hours while it was under development at our offices, but nothing could put it through its paces like on-site testing, and no other player feedback could be more genuine. At first, it seemed like no one would play the game. The machine sat untouched for hours, ignored by what few patrons the arcade had. This wasn't totally unexpected. The team was testing their machine during the NBA Finals in Chicago, in 1992, when Michael Jordan was reigning supreme. Thank you very much. The arcade manager almost closed early to avoid the inevitable riots, but a few teams entered at the last second and made their way over to the Mortal Kombat machine. It wasn't long before the crowd around the machine had grown to be four or five people deep. According to Tobias, the manager at that point began guarding the front door, and it flipped the arcade's open sign to closed. 
However, he'd admit a patron if they were there to play Mortal Kombat. It was a sign of things to come. The game's popularity was immediate and explosive. It soon became clear that the initial 200 cabinet run simply wasn't enough. Fans wanted more gore, more Easter eggs, and more Mortal Kombat. So Midway started looking at putting MK in people's homes. Graduating from the cabinets to the couch wasn't exactly a tough call. Per Boon, the arcade market was drying up, on top of which other games, like Street Fighter 2, had already found success in the SNES. Midway knew there was very little financial risk in giving Mortal Kombat the home console treatment as well, and brought Mortal Kombat's signature violence to living rooms all over the country. Well, kind of. Nintendo, at the time, upheld a strict anti-gore policy. So in lieu of blood, SNES MK characters gray sweat, resulting in Mortal Kombat's Sega Genesis port outselling the Super Nintendo version 5 to 1. At the same time that Mortal Kombat was making a bloody splash for the gaming community, a moral panic was beginning to swell around violence in video games. What you're about to see are scenes from two of the most violent new video games. First, we have Mortal Kombat. Senator Joe Lieberman led the charge against MK, leading to a highly publicized congressional hearing in 1993. Though Lieberman admitted that banning violent video games outright would be a First Amendment violation, it was clear he was out for non-pixelated blood. In response to the hearings, the gaming industry formed the Self-Regulatory Entertainment Software Rating Board, aka the ESRB, so that gamers everywhere would finally have an easy way to figure out that Mortal Kombat and Night Trap weren't meant for kids. Though the first Mortal Kombat received generally mixed reviews from critics, it was clear the game was a hit. The home version, published by Acclaim, had sold over 6 million copies. However, the team wasn't necessarily in sequel mode right away, and, in fact, were thinking about making a Star Wars game, until their general manager stepped in and talked some sense into everyone. Mortal Kombat 2 was darker and funnier than its predecessor, with Titan mechanics, alternate lighthearted fatalities, and brand new character animations. Of course, this series was ahead of its time in a lot of different ways, some not so positive. Echoing current crash-happy AAA releases, the first version of MK2 was effectively a public beta test, riddled with bugs and visibly unfinished. It took three painful revisions before the game was truly done, with a finalized version that had, uh, fewer bugs, releasing in January 1994. In spite of the development issues, MK2 became a commercial success, and a cultural phenomenon. It received overwhelmingly positive reviews from critics, and it was the highest-grossing arcade game of the year. In the first week of its home release, it made over $50 million, which, according to Claim, was the largest introduction of a video game in history. It even outsold the opening weekend box offices of major movies at the time, like Forrest Gump, True Lies, and The Lion King. Midway knew they needed to make a third Mortal Kombat. So in 1995, Mortal Kombat 3 hit the arcades and brought some brand new moves. This was the game that introduced chain combos to the series. Animalities, a run button, which allowed players to dash toward their opponent, and combat codes, which players could enter before matches to unlock additional features like health handicaps and secret character battles. Mortal Kombat 3 had notably different visuals from its predecessors, thanks to a more muted color palette, heavily digitized character sprites, and backgrounds created using pre-rendered 3D graphics. Additionally, though the previous two games had an aesthetic that leaned heavily on East Asian influences, MK3 went Western by way of Westworld. Seriously, there are so many robots in this game. After a massive marketing campaign, MK3 landed in North American arcades in April 1995. It wasn't long before it was ported to the Genesis, the SNES, and the newest console wars combatant, the PlayStation. Thanks to a deal between Sony and Midway, the PlayStation version was, according to Boone, basically indistinguishable from the arcade version, making that sweet 32-bit violence all the more accessible to gamers everywhere. Versions soon released for a slew of other systems, including the Sega Saturn, the Game Gear, and the Game Boy. However, the Game Boy version, in spite of being the first and only M-rated Game Boy title, was missing huge chunks of the game, including six of the original 15 fighters. Though MK3 did well on a commercial level, critics had plenty of complaints. 
Many took issue with the inclusion of less interesting characters in lieu of fan faves like Katana and Scorpion. This problem was roundly resolved with the release of Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, a standalone update to MK3 with an altered gameplay system, and 100% more Katana, thank god. A second and final update, 1996's Mortal Kombat Trilogy, was released shortly after that, re-establishing even more beloved characters and stages, as well as introducing the new aggressor bar and brutality mechanic. The game sold over a million copies, and Midway finally felt able to move on to the next installment of the series. Scorpion wins. Mortal Kombat 4 was released in North American arcades in 1997 and brought with it a host of innovations from the series as a whole. It was the first game in the Mortal Kombat series to use 3D graphics, all the better to see the brand new in-game weapons with. Characters could each equip a special object which they could then swing or throw at their opponents. This was also the game that saw the introduction of sidestepping, forcing players to rethink their movements in the arena, or the ice pit, or the Shaolin Temple. In spite of the graphical innovations, the gameplay in MK4 was intended to be largely similar to its predecessors, minus some of the more comical aspects of the other titles. Following its arcade release, the game was ported to PlayStation, Nintendo 64, and Microsoft Windows, with an exclusive upgraded edition with several additional characters, Mortal Kombat Gold, released for the Sega Dreamcast in 1999. Mortal Kombat 4 was also the end of an era. It was the last game in the series to have an arcade release. With the arcade cabinets behind them, it's clear the Midway team was in the mood to experiment. Enter Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero, a non-fighting game spin-off that focused on the story of Bihan, aka Elder Sub-Zero. Players quested to find a magical amulet while taking down enemies with a variety of moves inspired by the 2D fighting games. The game used a combination of digitized live actors and real-time 3D, resulting in what was meant to be a more realistic look than had been achieved in previous Mortal Kombat games. It was released for PlayStation and N64, and though it was impressive in appearance, critics weren't loving the game itself, including us. Seriously, we gave it a 4.9. Though the game seemed like a good idea on paper, a combination of unintuitive controls, repetitive enemies, and cheap deaths resulted in a reportedly miserable game experience. Hey, they can't all be winners. Speaking of which, Midway decided that the second time would be the charm for non-fighting game Mortal Kombat entries and produced 2000's Mortal Kombat Special Forces. Special Forces takes place before the story of the main game, with players controlling series mainstay Jax as he takes on criminal mastermind Kano. The game's development was challenging, to say the least. Before Special Forces was finished, John Tobias left Midway, resulting in significant cuts to the content of the game. Sonya Blade, meant to be a playable character, was completely removed, and other major plot elements were completely changed. The end result was a total mess of a game, largely considered to be one of the worst video games of all time. We, uh, we, we didn't really like this one either. After branching out with Mortal Kombat Mythologies and Special Forces, Mortal Kombat came back in 2002 with its fifth mainline game, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. While Mortal Kombat 4 had dabbled in 3D, both graphically and by letting players sidestep, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance would further the system, allowing players to walk back and forth along the Z-axis. Deadly Alliance also took Mortal Kombat 4's weapon system, but went a step further by making each fighter far more unique in their hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the previous games, each fighter had an identical moveset outside of their special attacks. Deadly Alliance finally shook this up, giving characters two hand-to-hand -hand styles and a weapon they could switch between on the fly and even incorporate into combos. Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance released in the early 2000s after the major decline in arcades. As such, it was the first mainline Mortal Kombat game not to release to arcades, and Midway decided to focus on single-player gameplay, creating a conquest mode. This mode would act as a tutorial and give players various missions for learning how to play, all while telling the game's story. Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance was well received, with many fans of the time eager to see a 3D fighting entry into the Mortal Kombat franchise. Deadly Alliance sold well, with Ed Boon stating the game had sold 3.5 million units by 2011. After the positive reception and sales for Deadly Alliance, Midway iterated on the same formula for their 2004 follow-up, Mortal Kombat Deception. For Deadly Alliance, the team had dropped the ability to perform stage kills, and each character only had one fatality. So, one of the focuses on Deception became bringing back that number of fatalities to two per character, as well as making the stages far more interactive. With weapons players could find and pick up, death traps, and branching paths players could knock each other into. Deception also brought back and expanded on Deadly Alliance's Conquest mode. 
While Deadly Alliance had players reading dialogue between and during fights, with no control in between, Mortal Kombat Deception turned its conquest mode into a full action adventure, with players controlling Bo Rai Cho as he explores, takes on quests, and of course partakes in classic Mortal Kombat fights. Notably, for Mortal Kombat Deception, the team wanted to focus on including an online mode, which had never been seen before in fighting games. The team was able to succeed, making Mortal Kombat Deception one of the first fighting games to include such a mode. Also added to Deception were a chess combat mode, a spin on classic chess with MK matches, and Puzzle Combat, a take on Tetris similar to Super Puzzle Fighter. Mortal Kombat Deception released in 2004 to generally positive reviews, with the gameplay changes from Deadly Alliance in particular receiving the most praise. In 2005, Midway released another spin-off to the Mortal Kombat universe with Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks. Shaolin Monks focused on players getting to control Liu Kang and Kung Lao during the events of Mortal Kombat 2, but with an action-adventure 3D beat-em-up gameplay style. Whereas Mortal Kombat mythologies and special forces had both been generally panned, Shaolin Monks received generally positive reviews and sold over 1 million copies. There was even a sequel planned, which would focus on Sub-Zero and Scorpion, that was eventually canned due to financial constraints. After the success of Mortal Kombat Deception, the seventh installment to the Mortal Kombat franchise would once again build upon the foundation set by Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, this time titled Mortal Kombat Armageddon. For Armageddon, the team included every single playable character from the previous six installments to Mortal Kombat, but dropped the number of fighting styles for most characters from three down to two, with some characters only having one style. Also returning was Mortal Kombat's Conquest mode, this time pulling elements from Shaolin Monks. As Armageddon's goal seemed to be to be the biggest Mortal Kombat yet, with the most playable characters, it also included a creative fighter mode as well as the ability to perform custom fatalities. Mortal Kombat Armageddon released in 2006 and reviewed fairly well, but not as strongly as the previous 3D entries in this series. While the massive roster was praised, lack of innovation to the gameplay was noticeable to reviewers, and the creative fatality replacing classic fatalities wasn't viewed favorably by all, with GameSpot describing it as a disappointing replacement to the classics. The eighth mainline entry into the Mortal Kombat franchise is a bit of an oddity, in that it includes the DC Universe. While Versus games had grown in prominence in the late 90s and early 2000s, with Marvel vs. Capcom, in particular, gaining widespread praise and popularity, Mortal Kombat would finally enter the fray of Versus fighters in 2008 with Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe. According to Ed Boon, originally Mortal Kombat 8 was meant to be a gritty reimagining of the Mortal Kombat franchise inspired by Gears of War. However, a deal was made with DC to create a crossover title, and from there, the original MK8 was scrapped. This new title would instead be, for the first time ever in a Mortal Kombat game, rated Teen. As such, the series' iconic fatalities were either entirely cut from the game, or were censored in various ways to keep the rating. Notably, the game featured a much heavier emphasis on its story mode, with cinematic cutscenes that would directly lead into the actual fights. Many of the new staples of the 3D games were dropped, including fighting styles and alternate weapons. Additionally, the game toned down in its 3D fighting, once again only allowing characters to sidestep in the Z-axis. Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe released in 2008 to moderately positive reception. The new story mode was praised by critics, in particular, and the game sold over 1.9 million units. After dipping their toes into Versus games, a major shakeup would occur, not only in the development of future games, but behind the scenes. Midway Games Chicago filed for bankruptcy and was subsequently purchased by Warner Brothers Interactive. What this meant was that for the first time ever, a Mortal Kombat game wouldn't be developed by Midway Games. Instead, the new Mortal Kombat 9, which would come to be called simply Mortal Kombat, would be developed by the brand new NetherRealm Studios. Now, while all of that sounds fairly dramatic, at the end of the day, NetherRealm Studios was pretty much just a rebranded Midway Games. WB kept Midway Chicago, rebranded it WB Games Chicago, and then later NetherRealm Studios. What that means is, Mortal Kombat co-creator Ed Boon would still be in charge and would go on to direct a new iteration of Mortal Kombat. Aside from Mortal Kombat 1, Mortal Kombat 9 is probably the most impactful game in the series. While the previous games had experimented with 3D and never quite found a format that stuck, similar to the recently released Street Fighter 4, Mortal Kombat 9 went back to its 2D fighting roots. This game would be 2.5D with all of the character models rendered in three dimensions, but with the actual fighting plane being two-dimensional. 
also similar to Street Fighter 4, which had brought Street Fighter back to its 2D roots with both its gameplay and character roster, the game focused on including characters specifically from the extremely popular Mortal Kombat's 1 to 3. Despite all the similarities in approach to gameplay, a 2.5D presentation, and character roster choices, according to Ed Boon, the team had already decided on this direction before Street Fighter 4's 2008 release. But Street Fighter 4's incredible success helped inform them that they had made the right choice in Mortal Kombat 9's direction. Beyond the retro-inspired feel of Mortal Kombat 9, the team wanted an emphasis on story and wanted to improve on the story mode they'd introduced with Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe. They also felt having a strong story mode would help appeal to casual players who would want a single-player mode. Mortal Kombat 9 also, once again, put a huge emphasis and spotlight on the series' famous fatalities. With the up-graphical engine, these fatalities were made far more gruesome than ever before. Sub-Zero wins. Fatality! Additionally, there were brand new X-Ray moves added to the game, which, when performed properly, would zoom in on the opponent and show exactly what part of their body was breaking or snapping apart internally. As the series went back to its roots and was seen as a reboot, Mortal Kombat 9 was branded as Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat was released in 2011, and all of these factors combined together to create what would become a critically acclaimed reboot for the series. Mortal Kombat was seen as both nostalgic and a great step forward for the series as a whole. It was so successful and well-received for NetherRealm Studios that all of their future fighting games moving forwards used it as a template, from the DC superhero-focused fighting series Injustice Gods Among Us to future Mortal Kombat entries. After the major success of Mortal Kombat, a new entry into the series was soon put into development. Revealed in 2014, Mortal Kombat's 10th entry would be dubbed Mortal Kombat X. Mortal Kombat X expanded on the format introduced by Mortal Kombat's 2011 reboot. It maintained an energy meter first utilized in Mortal Kombat 9, but also introduced a stamina meter, which players would consume by running, backdashing, using combo breakers, some special techniques, and stage interactions. The game also put a heavy focus on more brutal fatalities, and an additional batch of special ways to finish off your opponent. Brutalities were reintroduced from Mortal Kombat 3, although slightly changed up. NetherRealm also took a jab at players who rage quit online, allowing players to perform quitalities which would instantly kill an opponent if they quit playing during the middle of a match. Finally, faction kills were also introduced, and these let players perform special finishers based on which of the game's factions they were aligned with. Mortal Kombat X released in 2015, and like Mortal Kombat 2011, was once again a major success for the studio. Reviews for the game were generally positive, and perhaps more importantly, Mortal Kombat X was the fastest-selling Mortal Kombat game in the franchise's history. By 2019, the game had sold over 12 million copies. Through multiple combat packs and DLC, nine more characters were introduced, including famous guest characters like Jason Voorhees, Predator, Leatherface, and Alien. All these were included in the updated Mortal Kombat XL, released in 2016. With the incredible success of Mortal Kombat X, NetherRealm looked to once again improve upon their popular formula with the upcoming Mortal Kombat 11. <laughs> Announced in 2018, Mortal Kombat 11 looked to conclude the storyline of both the first Mortal Kombat and the story introduced in the rebooted Mortal Kombat 9, making Mortal Kombat, Mortal Kombat X, and Mortal Kombat 11 work as a trilogy. While the majority of the gameplay was similar to Mortal Kombat 9 and X before it, Mortal Kombat 11 introduced both fatal blows and crushing blows. Both of these added new ways to deal additional damage to your opponent, while, of course, showcasing the graphic new ways you were dealing harm to your foe. Mortal Kombat 11 also introduced a flawless block to its gameplay, as well as a mercy finishing move which gave players the chance to revive their opponents, giving them a small amount of health. Players were also given deeper customization, with skins, gear, and moves that players could all customize to create their favorite variations of character. Once again, the game received various DLC and new iterations that would include all of the DLC, with major franchises stepping into the fray. Mortal Kombat 11 saw the inclusion of the Joker, Spawn, the Terminator, Robocop, and even Rambo. Mortal Kombat 11 released the positive reviews in 2019. Its slower-paced combat, updated netcode for online play, and story mode were all praised. However, the game's requirement to be always online in order to progress was viewed negatively. While Mortal Kombat and Mortal Kombat X had both sold incredibly well, Mortal Kombat 11 was on another level. By 2022, Mortal Kombat 11 has sold over 15 million copies. All of that brings us to today. Mortal Kombat's 12th entry into their mainline franchise is 
once again rebooting the entire series and will be dubbed Mortal Kombat 1. The game takes place in an alternate universe created by Liu Kang, where all of the characters have new and different relationships with each other than previously established in the older titles. Notably, the game features a new cameo fighting system, where players will choose from a separate roster of characters to act as their cameo fighter. Players can then call upon these cameo fighters to perform additional attacks on their opponents, creating all new possibilities for combos and ways to counter. Mortal Kombat 1 is set to release on September 19, 2023. That wraps up the very long and very, very gory history of Mortal Kombat. What was your entry point into the series? Which character is your favorite? And why is it Sub-Zero?